The video you're about to see is a real-time recording made at a live ICRI technical session. It is important for you to realize that the remarks of the speaker do not necessarily represent the views of the International Concrete Repair Institute. This presentation is intended to refresh your memory if you attended the session and to allow you to benefit from the speaker's remarks and from the question and answer period if you were unable to attend. Now here is the introduction to the speaker for this session. Uh, the first uh, presentation is by uh, no Dr. Nicholas Carino, who is a research structural engineer, the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Um, his uh, research interests, of course, are in the area of non-destructive testing and uh, high-strength concrete or high-performance concrete, but I think he likes high-strength concrete. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> his uh, uh, presentation this morning is uh, non-destructive techniques used to investigate corrosion status in concrete structures. And uh, Milt, uh, either you or Sally need a check. He said he recently signed up for ICRI. I want to make sure he's paid his dues before he speaks this morning. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much, Nick. Well, good morning. It is a pleasure to be here with ICRI, and I do hope I can become uh, more actively involved in your organization. Uh, interest, my interests are in new construction and old construction because my interest is in NDT, as Randy has stated. And I did pay my dues. Okay, the subject is methods to evaluate the condition of corrosion in a structure. We all know that this is important to plan the repair and also to evaluate how a repair is behaving over time. Uh, my uh, written paper goes into a lot more detail about the corrosion process than I'm going to talk about this morning, but I think it's important to have basic understanding of the corrosion process in order to appreciate what these methods measure because they don't have all the answers that we're looking for, unfortunately, at this time. So it's good to know what goes on in the concrete when steel corrodes and what these things are telling us about what's going on in the concrete. So in my uh, presentation this morning, I'll briefly review the corrosion process. Uh, again, I won't go into the detail that's in the paper. And then I'll talk about three of the commonly used, commonly used methods for evaluating corrosion conditions. That these are the half-cell potential method, which most of you probably have heard about or familiar with. Concrete resistivity is not as widely used. And the last, the polarization resistance is receiving a lot more uh, interest lately. And it, it uh, can do things that the first two cannot. I begin by making the statement that corrosion of steel is inevitable. And this often scares people, but that's the facts of life. Uh, steel or iron doesn't want to be in its pure state. It'd rather be as, an, as a rust. So there's a tendency for it to revert from iron to rust. I mean, after all, if you think about how steel is made, you start out with an oxide of iron in, in the iron ore. And you add all this energy to make it into the pure iron and then the steel. And so you're putting it in a condition that it's not natural for it. So it, it tends, tends to revert back to its natural condition. Now in dry air, this conversion is very slow, but if we have water and oxygen, then the rate is fast and we know that exposed iron and steel rusts very rapidly when water is present. Now fortunately, we all know that in concrete, we're faced with this very uh, for, uh, fortuitous condition that because of the high pH in cement paste, an oxide film forms on the steel that protects it from rusting. And as long as that oxide film is there, the steel is protected. But that film can be broken down, and the two common mechanisms are by reducing the pH through the process of carbonation, which is explained in the paper, or the introduction or the penetration of chloride ions, which can be introduced during the uh, manufacture of the material, the concrete or the repair material, or by external access. So both of these two mechanisms break down that film. <coughs> so if that film is broken down, then corrosion can occur. I say can because there are other conditions necessary for corrosion to occur. One of those 
is if oxygen is present. And we'll also mention another factor uh, shortly. So corrosion is an electrochemical process, and that just simply means that it involves loss and gain of electrons. And the classical way of explaining corrosion is through the explanation of an electrolytic cell, which is the way a battery operates. In such a cell, we have two electrodes, the anode and the cathode. The, an the anode is where the corrosion takes place. It's where the metal dissolves and leaves behind electrons. So the anode ends up being a source of electrons. The cathode is the electrode where the electrons are used up in another reaction called a cathodic reaction. In order to complete this electrolytic, lit electrolytic cell, we require an external circuit between the two electrodes and also an internal circuit. In order to be maintain electrical neutrality, we have to have the electrons and charged particles moving both through an, an external circuit and an internal circuit. And this is a classical chemistry 101 representation of an electrolytic cell. Two cathode electrodes in solutions containing the ions of those electrodes. The anode is where the rusting or uh, oxidation reaction occurs and we get a loss of electrons and the ions go into solution. And these electrons then can flow through an external circuit if it's present and the elect these ex elect electrons combine with ions in that solution in what's called a cathodic reaction. So we use up the electrons that are generated by corrosion on the cathode. And here is uh, an internal connection that's required to maintain the neutrality of charges. So we, we not only have to have an external circuit, we also need a circuit between the two solutions. Now how does this relate to a bar? Well, before we get to that, not the wrong way, that's why. Excuse me. Okay, how does this relate to a bar in concrete? These anodic and cathodic sites exist on the same bar because of various reasons explained in the paper. The ions go into solution at the active sites called the anode, so that's where the rusting actually takes place, where we get loss of steel. We have electrons flowing through the steel bar, so the steel bar itself acts as the external circuit. And then there are, there's a flow of ions through the concrete, so that acts as the part of the internal circuit in that electrolytic cell. When we have external supply of oxygen with water in the concrete, we get formation of rust on the bar. So that's how the electrolytic cell is set up in a corroding bar in concrete. And we could represent that condition with this modified version of the first cell I showed you. And the modification is now we're introducing an, a resistance to represent the concrete. And this turns out to be an important characteristic of the concrete that affects how much current is going to flow between the anode and cathode. So it's going to affect the rate at which the corrosion occurs. And we have control over this by using low water cement ratio materials. <laughs> so in, in order to have corrosion of steel in concrete, we need to first have a loss of passivity of the steel, either by introduction of chloride or carbonation. We need to have oxygen to have one of those reactions take place, the cathodic reaction. Without oxygen, corrosion uh, is very, very slow. We need to have flow of ions between the anode and the cathode. This is where the concrete resistivity comes into play. Now, all of these uh, function together to, to affect what the service life of the concrete will be. And it's affected by how long it takes to lose that passivity and then the subsequent rate of corrosion when the passivity is lost. And Tutti, a researcher from, where is he from? Uh, Norway, Sweden, one of those Nordic countries, came up with this very elegant model to explain the uh, service life of a reinforced concrete structure. 
So on the vertical axis is degree of corrosion, on the horizontal axis is time. So here nothing is happening as far as degree of corrosion until we get to what's called the initiation point. This would be when we have the loss of passivity, either through the carbonation or um, introduction of uh, chloride ions. Once passivity is lost, then we get an increase in degree of corrosion with time. And when the degree of corrosion reaches some damage threshold level, we then have reached the service life. Now this damage threshold level is ill-defined. It could be uh, when the concrete spalls, or it could be when you get enough loss in cross-section that the strength of the member is in jeopardy. Now you can see by doing something different to the concrete, we can extend the initiation period and also change the rate at which the uh, corrosion takes place. And in so doing, we can increase the service life. So this simple model can be used to explain why low water cement ratio concrete is better, why having more cover is better. Okay, so that's the basic of uh, the corrosion process. Now I'd like to get into these three methods. Half cell potential. This is an indicator of the likelihood of corrosion activity. Electrical resistivity affects the rate of corrosion, and the last method actually tells us to be, is an indicator of the corrosion rate. It actually measures the rate of corrosion. Okay, we're, we're trying to learn something about the concrete before it gets to this condition. When it's in this condition, it's too late. So we'd like to know, is this corrosion active so that we can take some steps to prevent this uh, process or this degree of deterioration from taking place? The half cell potential method is an ASTM standard and it's based on the principle that when we have this corrosion taking place, the flow of charges that occur in the concrete is associated with an electric field. And we measure the electrical potential of that field on the surface of the concrete. And the magnitude of that measured voltage gives us an indication of whether or not corrosion is occurring. This is a, an, an illustration to explain what I just said in words. The yellow lines represent the flow of ions through the concrete from the corroding part to the cathodic part of the rebar. So associated with that flow are potential lines. That's what the red curves are. And you see that these intersect the top surface of the concrete. So when, we, when we're doing the half cell potential measurement, we're actually measuring the level of these potentials as we scan across the, the, the concrete. And you see that when you're directly over the bar, these potential values are more negative than when you're far away. I mean, when you're directly over the corroding site, the potentials are more negative than when you're further away. So that's how we sense where corrosion might be happening. And the way we do that is using this half cell uh, using the copper, copper sulfate half cell, which is nothing more than a copper bar and a copper sulfate solution. That's connected to a voltmeter. The voltmeter is connected to the reinforcing bar. And you scan the half cell across the surface of the concrete, or you do tests at different points. And you look at what the uh, voltage values are. There are many different kinds of uh, apparatus that can be used. Here is this one of them. Uh, some are manual that you have to enter the numbers that, you, uh, that, are, that are displayed. Others are computer operated. Oops. And they come in different uh, geometries. Some are wheels, multiple wheels, single probe, as I just showed you, multiple probes. So different uh, variations have been developed for speeding up the data acquisition. Some considerations in using this method, the concrete has to be sufficiently moist, and ASTM provides a criterion for deciding whether it's sufficiently moist. The most important part, that it only provides an indication of the likelihood of corrosion. And these are criteria that have been developed uh, over time. 
and they are no longer in the body of the ASTM standard, by the way. They've been moved to the appendix because these are not absolute hard and fast limits. And the, generally, the more negative the potential, the more likelihood that corrosion is, in, is involved. Some factors to consider in this method is that if you have a high resistance top surface, then you're going to get more negative numbers, but it does not mean that there is a more there's a higher likelihood of corrosion. If there is an absence, the absence of oxygen, you can have a high negative value, but still be very low uh, corrosion rate. And the deeper the bars are, the more uniform the surface values of uh, potential will be. So it's more difficult to detect where the corrosion is taking place. This is a plot of corrosion current measured by the polarization method I'll get to shortly versus the half cell potential readings. And there are the two values of minus 200 and 350, which is the gray land in that uh, previous uh, criterion I showed you. And the points above this horizontal line within those two limits represent a high rate of corrosion, which according to the C876, you don't know, you can't decide whether it's high or, high or low. And here we have some significant corrosion occurring at even much more positive values of half cell potential. So the bottom line is that there is not a very good correlation between the half cell potential and how much corrosion is actually taking place. And the technique that is often used for an, uh, plotting and interpreting the results is by plotting contours of the potential values and looking for where there are steep changes in the half cell potentials. This is an example of an instrument that actually plots the contours as data are gathered and that's the kind of plot you can get by these more uh, modern apparatus. Okay, next is the concrete resistivity. As I've tried to explain, the rate of corrosion is controlled by how easily it is for ions to move through the concrete. And this is where the concrete res resistivity comes into play. The term resistivity is uh, used to characterize a material property of, a mater of the material related to its resistance. It's numerically equal to the resistance of a unit cube of a material. And the resistance of a conductor is the resistivity times the length divided by the area. So that's, you can turn this thing around and solve for the resistivity. It, it's a material property. One of the methods that can be used is based on the, the Wenner probe, which was developed in the early 1900s for measuring soil resistivity. There are four probes on the surface. A, uh, current is passed between the outer two probes and we measure the voltage between the inner two probes and there's an equation that's been derived based on this being an infinite material that allows us to calculate the resistivity from the measured voltage and current. And this is an early version of this type of apparatus and here is a more modern computerized version. So these things are commercially available. In order to apply the Wenner probe and this, the equations that I just showed you, the equation I just showed you, uh, there has to be sufficient spacing between the probes so that we're getting an average uh, property measurement. The depth and width of the member has to be big enough so that the equation is, uh, is applicable because it was derived on an infinite size uh, object. If the surface has high resistivity, it will give you an erroneous measure of the resistivity of the concrete and if steel reinforcing bars are close to the probes and they have to be taken into account. So again, it's not a simple black and white measurement. You have to know what it is you're measuring and the factors that affect the, the measurement. Here is a plot of resistivity versus the same corrosion current that I showed you earlier. And here, I think you can all agree that there's a better correlation between the two. If the resistivity is roughly above this 100, then there's very few cases where there's a lot of corrosion. <coughs> the final method is the polarization resistance. And 
and uh, this tries to overcome the deficiencies of the half cell potential measurement and the resistivity measurement. The half cell only provides information on the likelihood that corrosion is occurring. Resistivity in combination with half cell provides a qualitative indicator of corrosion rate, but it doesn't, you can't quantify it based on those two measurements. Polarization resistance actually gives a measurement of the instantaneous corrosion rate at the point where the test is carried out. This is a schematic of how the test is carried out. We have our half cell potential circuit here just as in the half cell potential method, but now we introduce a current source and another electrode, a ring that is around the, the reference cell. And the measurement is a two-step process. First we measure the half cell potential without any current flowing <coughs> through this part of the circuit, so the switch is open. And then we close the switch and we measure the change in voltage as a function of different amounts of current flowing to this outer uh, electrode or the counter electrode. And the, we make a plot of that change in voltage versus the current divided by the area of the bar to which the current flows. And from that plot, we, we obtain the slope, and that slope is the, the polar polarization resistance. And that is used with this constant B to obtain the corrosion current. So this is what we are interested in finding out, and the test method gives us this R sub P. We have to make some assumptions about, about what B is, and the paper explains that it can vary between approximately 25 and 50. Once we measure this value, we can convert it to actual amount of material lost per year using Faraday's law. So you can actually change the measurement to millimeters of reinforcement loss per year. Some considerations that have to be uh, kept in mind. The, the measurement only gives us the corrosion rate at a particular particular instant in time and it will change as conditions in the concrete change and as temperature changes. It's only applicable to steel, bare steel bars. The cover cannot be more than about four inches. And this biggest problem is that there's an uncertainty about how much of the bar that is being polarized, what area is affected by the polarization. So there has been a technique developed that tries to eliminate that by using a, another ring called a guard electrode that confines the current flows. So when we, we make our current measurement, we're measuring it for this interior electrode, so the current lines are perpendicular to the bar. But we have a well-defined amount of bar that is involved in this polarization, so it gives us a better uh, estimate of the corrosion current. This is one of the commercial apparatus based on this method. This is the, the sensing head showing the guard electrode, and this is the actual counter electrode where we make the measurement. The apparatus also comes with another probe that can be used to measure resistivity. This is different from the four uh, probe uh, winner system. Here showing the, the uh, measuring head strapped to a column. It takes something like five to six minutes to make the measurement. And here the resistivity probe is being used. So to summarize, corrosion occurs if we have loss of passivity of the steel. It requires oxygen. And the rate of, at which the bar corrodes is affected by the resistivity of the concrete and temperature. I didn't make much mention of temperature, but what you measure in the winter would be different from what you measure in the summer, all other conditions being the same. The half cell potential gives us an indication that the likelihood that corrosion is occurring, but it's very hard to uh, come up with absolute values of the, the half cell potential values that are indicative of high uh, likelihood of corrosion. The resistivity affects the corrosion rate, so it's a good supplemental uh, test to carry out. And finally, the polarization resistant method actually measures corrosion rate. 
It assumes that the corrosion is occurring uniformly over the bar, but it's been shown that localized pitting can occur at uh, four to eight times deeper, uh, can be four to eight times deeper than what is calculated on the basis of uniform uh, corrosion. As I just mentioned, the measurement is only valid at the time it is taken, and all corrosion taste testing should be supplemented by at least these, these other two, determination, chloride ion content, and carbonation. And finally, this whole business is very complicated, and if you need this kind of work done, it's best to hire an expert and not just go buy the equipment and try to do it yourself until you become experienced at it. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Any questions, I'd be glad to answer. In the back, yeah, I have a question. With regard to the uh, validity and interpretation of the data from each of these devices, how is it affected by two things? One, the presence of delamination and second, uh, if the corrosion is the result of carbonation and not uh, chloride-induced corrosion. Okay, I'll try to guess the first. Uh, if you have a delamination, then you don't, you don't have a complete circuit, so you can't carry out the measurement. Okay, and I point to Randy, because he's the expert. I'm the academic. <laughs> he's one of the... Yeah, I mean, there's some level of uh, threshold where it's going to be meaningless. And then, can you tell the difference between whether it's due to carbonation or chloride? Is that what? Well, I asked the question was, are the, is the data collected from these devices, is the validity and or the interpretation different uh, if it's corrosion caused by carbonation as compared to corrosion caused by uh, chloride? Will an expert in corrosion answer that question? Is, if you get a certain reading, uh, corrosion current does it, does it mean the same, independent of how that... Uh, yeah, it's a different chemistry, so it is... The answer is yes. You probably need to consider the whole picture, not just rely on the measurement. You have to understand what it is that has led to the, uh, the corrosion. Yeah, is there any correlation between the, the Coulomb rating or the permeability of the concrete to the readings that you get out of this? Or does that make any, any sense? Rating. Well, uh, yeah, the, a lower Coulomb rating is, tells you you have a less permeable concrete, which is going to mean that it'll probably have a lower uh, corrosion rate when corrosion does occur. The it, a lower Coulomb value would also tell us that it would take longer for the loss of passivity or the carbonation to get to the level of the bar. So. You can't make a one-to-one -one correlation between Coulomb and what you get here, but the Coulomb will tell you, you know, the likelihood of uh, having a longer service life. If you have a, a high Coulomb and a low Coulomb concrete, you can say you know, that one is going to take longer for the concrete to, uh, or the steel to, to reach the unfavorable condition. So it's probably more important when it's a new uh, structure made. Chloride contaminated, you got ions in there that will affect the pull something out. It's got a lot of chlorides in it. There's an ionic flow that uh, may bias the result. So, but there, there should, you know, there's some correlation probably between having very low resistivity concrete and what it's going to do to do the job long term. Any other questions? One more question. Now, how effective is this this analysis when you got say vertical cracks in the concrete, though, despite the fact that you got low pools? Vertical cracks. Well, in a horizontal surface, you got a crack there. I don't know. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Appreciate it.